Welcome to Success at Scale, the podcast that covers business stories from experienced entrepreneurs and startup founders on how to translate business ideas into business results. I'm your host, Greg Stein, and today we're going to talk with Jerry Campbell, who is the CEO at his new hip company called Cryptonomic.io. Uh, today, we're going to talk about, we're going to dig into NFTs, Web3, crypto, blockchain, Web3 strategy, and so much more. So without further ado, I think the first thing we have to do is introduce Jerry. Tell us a little bit about you, Jerry. Go. Yeah, sure, sure. Wow, so much energy. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> so I've been at the internet since before it was cool. And I started in about uh, 95 at a company called CompuServe that nobody remembers. And my job was to innovate, bring new products to market, and uh, help people figure out exactly how to how the consumers were going to adopt this new crazy web thing. And I took a tour from uh, CompuServe to AltaVista to Compaq to AOL, where I launched um, Google AdWords with Google. So we were the first partner that they had there. All the way along, kind of innovating. Left there was global head of technology for Reuters, which was very interesting. Definitely about innovation. It was about figuring out how to reinvent the whole kind of command line uh, thing that was the Reuters terminal and, and take that to market. A little bit off kilter for me. So then went back to angel investing, invested in two companies that were acquired by Twitter in 2009 and uh, also one that was acquired by AOL. So I had my, had my spin at angel investing and I stopped because uh, the, the, uh, the deals were pretty sweet at the time. And then uh, started a consulting company as part of that. We rolled in full time with a company called Beachbody that you may be familiar with. And we launched a service. I was co-founder of or co-creator of Beachbody On Demand, which was their streaming service. And we went from zero to $100 million in 18 months, a million subscribers right around that time. So that was a pretty wild ride. Along the way, I wrote a book about new product development because I learned some things about launching new technology to the market. And currently, Cryptonomic is transforming the music space. So we're very early stages in that. I mean, what a what a mouthful you got there. And we got to unpack all of this because there's a lot of stuff in there. I mean, here's what I'm understanding so far. You got you've generated patented technology that's used by billions. You've got partnerships with AOL. You've done stuff with Google and AdWords and creating beach body on demand. I mean, there's a lot here. Uh, mm -hmm. So let's let's slow it up a little bit and uh, <laughs> rewind. You know, like how do you how do you break into this world that that you're in now and change in the music business. So like, you know, how does it all connect? Yeah, I'll tell you the, the thing for me, I've traveled back and forth between business, product, and technology. And I've taken whatever role is necessary. I'm fortunate enough to be able to have a brain that kind of adapts. But I think anybody can do that. It's It was really mostly about understanding the goal in each case. And I, I, I could walk through a couple of stories and examples, but it's, it's, you know, for me, it's been about saying yes it's a bit about showing up and, and, you know, I, I actually own the domain who lets me do this.com. That's amazing. There are so many times that I'd be like, who lets me make these decisions? Who lets me cut, cut this deal. But I figured out that, you know, knowledge can be balanced out very well with a whole lot of eagerness and energy. So I've, I've never hesitated to rise to whatever task uh, presented itself. And I just keep getting opportunities to do cool stuff. And I, I could be a sucker because I never say no. There you go. Well, I, I love it. Now, there's this whole, you know, shift that's happening in terms of the internet and and where things are going and, and Web3 and all of this. Maybe tell us a little bit about your experience being in the early days of the internet and the evolution to now and where the future is headed. Yeah, I like that a lot because it is it is a natural progression. And there are times when it feels like these natural progressions have kind of these punctuated real accelerations, and that's where we are today. But I actually started pre-Web 1. So my, my very first company, I was in college, and I was working in an ad agency, and I figured out on this Commodore 64, I could do stuff. Like I could write and set type you know, with with a computer rather than using a linotype and all of that other stuff. And so this was like early 90s. And uh, and so what I figured out very early was computers could do stuff and I could make money doing stuff on computers. And I didn't actually have to know as much about the stuff I was doing. I just had to know how the computer worked. So um, I, I was doing desktop publishing, laying out newspapers, doing all that kind of stuff. I actually was at a startup newspaper for a while. And then Web1 hit. And when the first time I ever saw a browser, I can remember it. I was in, uh, actually, I was using Gopher and all of those those tools, FTP, way back when. As, a I was long a time ago, my friend. It is a long, I'm, I'm gray beard, right? You can see it. <laughs> um, 
But the the thing that that just blew me away was the idea in web one, it was you could publish something now and it was available around the world instantaneously. Right. And with FTP and Gopher, that was pretty cool. But as soon as I saw a browser, I thought, this is everything. This is literally everything. And at that point in time, you had to be able to write code. You had to do the HTML markup and use the blink tags and all that crap. Um, but that, that it stuck with me. Like the world is going to change. And I read a book by Nicholas Negroponte called Being Digital. And he was at the MIT Media Lab. And he the, the book just laid out for me very clearly, the world was going to move from atoms to bits. We were going to ship bits. We were going to create in bits. We were going to do everything in a way that was completely transportable, everything that could be done. And that's what stuck with me. So in Web1, um, I was responsible for the personal page service at, uh, at AOL. I was actually an intern. I got the internship and I was managing like the IBM mainframe forum or something. I'm like, hey, can I can I dig into this like other stuff? And and uh, ended up being the manager, business owner of a uh, thing called Our World, which was similar to GeoCities. So what we did was we helped individuals publish on the web. Mm-hmm. And then we launched a thing called Business Web. And Business Web was interesting because before Business Web, if you wanted a domain name, you had to fill out a piece of paper and, and, and put it in an envelope and put a stamp on it and mail it to Internet in order to get a uh, domain name. So we built in 90. Six ninety seven. we built the very first GoDaddy style interface into um, internet so you could register domain names. And funny story, I was sitting there like nobody else had ever seen programmatic access to, to the domain database. Literally, it was, I, I didn't know what I was looking at at the time because I was looking up T-H-E, the.com. Oh, that's available. Um, you know, banana.com. Yeah, that's everything. Literally, because nobody had ever seen this stuff. Everything was right. available. Um, but so that was that was web one. Web two got really interesting because then you could start to to write stuff to and from. And and I would put the the marker somewhere like 98, 97, when you could really start to do commerce very easily and you could start to do things like you could interact with a web page, put data in, you could write a social post and have it post on you know, I don't know, Friendster or something. That was huge because before you had to write HTML for things to be published. Then, you know, as Web2 started, it accelerated really quickly from simple things um, like being able to, you know, create a page and comment all the way into e-commerce very quickly. And then we accelerated into mobile. And so largely what we know for the last almost 20 years, maybe more, has been really Web 2, which is all of these applications that go two ways, back and forth, where you can buy stuff and create stuff and write and do pictures and, you know, everything through apps and mobile. And that's been really interesting. Web 3, when I got my head around crypto in about 2016, um, I remember there being a time about... It was probably two months where I had to rewrite in my head how everything worked, right? Yeah. And and once I rewrote in my head how it worked, I thought, wow, I understand this and this is fundamentally different. You know, here's the question about Web3, right? So many people say that there's an opportunity to, you know, democratize the online experience and enable users to control the use of their data and, you know, open the door to mass customization as it pertains to you know, just this huge opportunity and this huge ecosystem in, in Web3. Like, you know, how do you look at that, right? You know, in, in today's world, what is what is Web3 really mean to you? What are those key concepts that we can put our heads on, you know? Yeah, I've got, I've got two key concepts. And I actually feel like an evangelist because I end up talking to so many people trying to help them get their heads around the, the stuff that I've, I've been able to comprehend. The first one is all applications are written on a database. Right, so it doesn't matter whether you're talking about an app on your phone, a native app, whether it's a web page, whether it's a CRM app. Everything is driven out of a database. The navigation, all of the stuff it stores, your credit card data, your social data, anything that you do, it's all in a database. So the first thing about Web three is the database has changed. In a world where you have to protect and control your database, right? If you think about the the you know Waze, Waze has this incredibly valuable data all about where things are and how to get from place to place and where the police are and all of that. And they protect that data and they curate that data and that becomes a source of value. Well, what happened with Bitcoin, and this was the biggest innovation that I think we've seen in the last 15, 20 years, is when you allow 
people who don't trust each other to all write to the same database, now you've got the ability for applications to be collaborative in a new way. You've got the ability, and I don't think data, we're not going to run, you know, your, your apps are not going to be drawing off the blockchain forever, or, you know, there are digital apps or, excuse me, distributed apps that do that. I think it'll be a blend, but the first idea is anything that's transactional that, that can be broken out and sent across untrusted lines is going to do that. Um, and I'll stop there for a second and then transition because I could that I could keep going down that path, but it's really more important to go to the second innovation that tagged right along with that, which is Bitcoin really is just simply ownership. I own a Bitcoin and that's kind of all there is to it. Ethereum gave us the ability to write executable code and then put that onto the blockchain. So now it's not just saying Greg has a Bitcoin, he gave it to Jerry and there was a transaction price and that's recorded in the annals of history forever. That's interesting. What's really interesting is that you and I may have a smart contract that we use between us that says, right. you give me the Bitcoin, I give you the keys to my place, you stay in my place for a week, I have somebody check it, give you your deposit back right? Mm -hmm. That's the mm -hmm. kind of executable software. And now we're untrusted parties necessarily. I don't, I may not know you, I, you know, whatever, but now we can use a mechanism to do things. And that's where all of the really creative stuff comes. But the first idea is the untrusted database. Right. Makes perfect sense. I guess, you know, the question is, how does this impact you know, the world of business and digital transformation. And maybe, you know, we, we speak to that in the context of what you're working on now. I mean, it, it's kind of interesting. You know, I know you're doing some crazy things with cryptonomic, but like, how, how would how would we kind of take this take this away? That's, that's an awesome lead into the second part of, of that answer, which is because we can attach value now down to the item level, and I'll get really specific. If I buy something from Amazon, there's something in a warehouse, they pick that up, they put it in their truck, they ship it to me. That thing does not have a transaction attached to it. It's separated from the transaction. And so that supply chain is closed, right? right. What's really cool with the digital good is I can make a song into an NFT. And so every time that song is traded or sold, I as the creator could get 10% because of the smart contract. And so that, that to me, you know, Web3, so we've got the read web, we've got the read write web, and now we've got the read write transact web, where content itself can have the business model attached to it. Now, what that gets into with cryptonomic, we're, we saw a need in the market, and my, my business partner is, uh, uh, in addition to Greg Snow, who's been my longtime business partner, um, Dean Wilson, who is Dead Mouse's business partner and manager. Um, he's seen this, I don't know if, you know, anybody who's seen this, if you take a look, um, Dead Mouse has been moving very quickly in the adoption of Web3. And as I started to talk to Dean about the ideas of what we could do, we just like, it was like an explosion went off in the ideas. So what Cryptonomic is doing is basically building what an artist and a manager would like to have in order to build an audience, build revenue and that kind of thing. What that means is a couple things. First of all, an NFT uh, the, the term NFT needs to be replaced. The way I think about it is that it's a lifetime membership. So we're building communities and those communities are, um, they're, they're owned and, and kind of managed or uh, the, the guidelines are all set by the artist. It's not, you know, it's not Patreon that's setting the guidelines or anything else. This is, this is Dead Mouse's community. And the membership to get in, there'll be a limited number of memberships and they're a lifetime membership. So I buy the NFT one time. And that gives me the ability then to associate, be a part of that community and not feel like, you know, like Netflix, I get billed, you know, $14.99 a month forever. And if I stop paying, I'm not a part of the community. Music, totally. art, all of those things are very different. If I identify with somebody, I want to be a part of that. And I don't want that to be at risk all the time. So that's the first piece. So an NFT becomes a membership. If I decide to leave the community, I can sell it. And the community owners will get a little chunk of that because that membership as an NFT has the transaction attached to it through the smart contracts. And then once you're in the community, doing all kinds of things like using protected NFTs to pre-release music. So 72 hour window before a song hits Spotify or a live streamed video conference, or video uh, live show that nobody else, you know, other than this community can see or, you know, recording sessions or whatever. So once you're in the community, the opportunity to do all kinds of really creative things open up. And then we underpin that with a token that so you get rewarded for doing things. And you also have the chance to cash in the rewards and you level up the more tokens you earn, uh, you become more and more powerful in the community. And so, so that's kind of it. 
Cryptonomic sounds super interesting and exciting. When when can we expect to uh, you know see this for ourselves for any of the listens listeners that are out there? Yeah, uh, Q one. So we're actively building, adjusting, uh, working out some of the bugs because uh, it's a little different when you take somebody's brand under their brand to market. You know, we are representing the artists themselves. So we've, it's a uh, it's a it's a tricky thing, and especially in the space where a lot of the regulation hasn't been fully settled. We're trying to be really careful. But uh, Q1, we're going to have at least one, if not four, um, different communities in market. And by the end of the year, we'll have 40 of them. And our goal is to have, uh, you know, out of the top 1,000 Spotify streamers, we want to have three or 400 of those by the end of uh, 2025. Well, you're hearing it first, ladies and gentlemen. This is this is where it's happening right here. I, I don't know if this is even public knowledge, Jerry, what you're talking about here. So this is pretty cool. I'm pretty excited to share this with the world. But now, I mean, let's switch gears, right? So so you've got Cryptonomic. You're up to something really cool and sneaky and special here with Web3. How, how does this apply to just somebody that's listening to this and saying, you know, this all sounds great, Jerry, but like, how does this apply to my business? You know, you know, I, I'm a... You know, I'm in tech or maybe I'm not in tech, you know, but I'm looking to sell more products. And, you know, what kind of practical advice would you give to someone uh, listening to this podcast? Yeah, the number one thing is don't believe the hype, right? The the hype around decentralization. I philosophically agree with it. I just think that it is an ideal that is going to be very dangerous to tie yourself to unless you are on the cutting edge of creating DAOs and doing all of this stuff. I think for for most business owners or for most product people or whoever else, it's going to be about the small steps. And the small steps really are how could you use a token or an NFT to protect, deliver something unique, or reward your users or customers for doing something? And it's it really does come down to that. And I want to tell a quick story. I was at Alta Vista and broadband had just come out. And so we were, you know, actually I was at Compaq and then Alta Vista. So we were selling the computers that were broadband ready, which that didn't even really mean anything. They had an ethernet card. Um, we believe that there was this big discontinuity that the, the, that the broadband web was so fast and always connected that it would change the world. So I was on a team, a corp dev team that was trying to sell Alta Vista as a broadband service. And we went to AOL before I actually worked at AOL sat down and one of the the executive vice presidents said, you know, it's not a discontinuity. You know, as much as all of the technology is different underneath the covers, as much as you are really fired up about it and you get it to the end user, all it means is that the web will be a little faster. Right. And when I when I thought about that, first of all, I resisted it. And then when I thought about that, I thought, you know, that's actually true. I'll, I'll be able to get more video. I'll be able to get more things. But a true discontinuity is a break and, and it's the re requirement for the users to adopt something fundamentally new. It was like going from not having a computer to having a computer. That was a real discontinuity. The right. difference in Web3, so first of all, it's going to be simple. It's going to, it's got to be things that people already know how to use. I posted something on LinkedIn recently about metaphors. When we began to shop online, the metaphor was a shopping cart. Nobody had to learn anything new. And even though for the people building websites that had shopping, it was fundamentally different. So one of the really useful things that I think people can do now is leave a lot of the fluff behind, leave a lot of the, the big ideas and the, the decentralization and the, you know, all of the inner workings and really look at what is a benefit to the user. And that to me is the magic. And I'll tell you, my, my belief is that if you ask the right questions in the right way, people will tell you in terms that they don't even necessarily understand what they need and what they want. And, uh, and that to me is kind of the magic here. So don't overestimate the transformation potential of this. Look at the incremental value that can be brought by people having better ownership, better membership, and then better ability to be rewarded. I think you just said something that was really powerful that was even beyond Web3 and NFTs and blockchains and all this stuff, which is if you ask the right questions. Right. And I think there's something really special in that. I think that's extremely actionable for anybody that's listening to this podcast. So, you know, think about, you know, the questions to ask, uh, whether it's in the context of your customers, whether it's in the context of your, you know, your relationships, whether it's in the context of, of your business, asking the right questions. People overlook that all the time, uh, you know, and I, I think it's just uh, so valuable, Jerry. Would you would you agree? I do agree. And, and I, I, there was a point at AOL when I had about a 
eight million dollar market research budget and we were doing traditional market research when you ask you know likert scale questions and all that stuff and i wasn't getting actual actionable product development uh information because we'd say do you like this do you like that we would do focus groups and it was always clouded by group dynamics and so what we did was we bought a semi truck and we rolled it up to malls and we had computer stations set up and we didn't say anything it was like sit down here see if you can do this and this almost looked like a usability thing mm -hmm. but we would videotape people what they were doing and so we would ask open-ended questions so you're a mom and you're using technology what does it mean to you to use technology right if you go in with the mindset that a mom is going to think about safety, security, and privacy, and you're going to ask all those questions, they'll try to answer the questions as best they can. But we found out when they sat down in front of those terminals or in front of those computers, and we said, you know, what is this product? What does it do? Oh my gosh, it's a calendar. And I can see where all my kids are supposed to be all at the same time because it combines everybody's calendar. Those open-ended questions draw out from people and they'll tell you, like, imagine what, you know, what would a perfect product be in this space? And the questions that we asked when we were starting to form Cryptonomic is we reached out to, we do we do one-on-one -on -one interviews or stimulus uh, questions and record the answers. And it's, how do you think about your favorite band, right? Simple questions. How do you think about them? Right. What, are the, what are your favorite things to engage with them, right? And then so you start with those open-ended qualitative questions, which requires a lot of analysis. And then you drive down into the quantitative stuff. Once you get the direction where you're going to go, then the quantitative stuff helps you dial it in. But ultimately, the launch of a product and the review of a prototype is the, is the very best way to get real feedback. Absolutely spot on. And, you know, it's funny, you know, in the world of sales and selling, right? You know, the best people who, who sell stuff, they ask, like, ask you lots of questions, right? And, you know, there are too many people who want to tell you everything, but they don't actually listen. And I think that that's the other skill that you've also listed out here, which is listening, right? And understanding what the needs are of your customers. I think that's, that's critically important. Yeah, I've got a I've got a thing that I talk about a lot when I'm talking to entrepreneurs, and it's it's that it's it's about the appropriate use of passion, mm. right? And passion for a technology. I I was CEO of a of a real time search company. We raised seven million dollars, and I flew the company into the mountain. And the reason was that I believed and I was passionate about a certain way of doing things, but I had already spent 10 years thinking more about search than anybody ever had. So I had this vision that was driven my, by my view of what the world would be, and we missed it, right? The appropriate use of passion, and I think of it in two ways. One is be passionate about the people that you're serving. I'm not Joel, who's dead mouse. I, I'm not him, but I'm really passionate about understanding his problems in such a way that I can help to address those. So I don't go in with any presuppositions. And the other passion is, once you find that thing, be passionate about listening and delivering and getting it right. Right. The, the one thing that, that I, as a human, I always have to fight giving up is that I know the best answer. I don't know the best answer. I can ask the people who need the solution and I can drive really hard to make sure that it matches. But if my passion is about my own vision, I'm more likely to be challenged. Spot on, man. You know, it's funny you say this every single time we do this podcast, it comes to the same place. People, passion, purpose, or, you know, flip it around any which order you want. But yeah. that is the topic every single time there's got to be something special in there because uh, I think it's the truth, you know, well, I'll wax poetic here for a second. The, if you, if you go to like, okay, really far out here, great products meet human needs. Human needs haven't really changed over time. We need to interact. We need to transact. We need to become informed and become knowledgeable. They're sure. just really basic things that we need. That's right. And so when you look at that, the, the notion of, of what we do as product people, as business creators or whatever else, that ability to help people do something very human, that is passion to me. You know, and, and I look at it and I think you know, life purpose here is to create and connect. I want to create stuff and help people create stuff that connects people. That has been my North Star. So when I look at this crazy career I've had all over all these different things that don't seem to line up. I have always gone at transition points to the largest opportunity that I have to create something or work with people to create something that helps connect people. And one time it was about helping them publish. And another time it was help, helping them find things. And another time it was helping them get their bodies fit. 
right? Mm-hmm. And another time it was about efficient markets, but it's always the same thing. So to me, the passion that's driven here really just meets this human need that we all have. And we can get all excited about technology and we can get all excited about money and we can get all excited about the press that we get. But the truth is if we're meeting human needs and we're driven by something that is fundamentally human, it works out. All right. So then that brings me to the next logical question, which is what's your passion? What gets you up every day? Uh, what, what gets you lit up? Yeah, I I absolutely love seeing people use the things that I've helped create. Amazing. So I I have I have uh, literally every time I pick up a piece of technology, I get a smile because I was on a team. And a quick story here. I don't know how we're doing on time, but quick story. We um, at AOL, I had really smart people who worked. We all worked really well together. And we were trying to figure out where the cutting edge was and what problems we could solve for our customers. We had 20 million people a day on our service using AOL search. It was a big deal. So we had these things called Thinking Thursdays. And and anybody anybody that was in the extended organization of about 100 people could come and we'd have about six or seven people. And uh, we looked at a problem one day and it was, can people find what they're looking for? And the answer was no. People were going to the second page, people were reformulating their queries, whatever. So we thought about this crazy thing and people started throwing ideas out. And what it ended up was, well, what if we could help people search? What if we had a database of successful queries? And as you're typing, we could suggest those queries that are going to be more relevant and more useful. And so we patented that. And that's when you type in a search entry box and it makes suggestions. Mm-hmm. Um, that is that is patented 8005919. <laughs> Amazing. Well, uh, you know your stuff, and I love your passion, and I love your purpose too. Um, and uh, it's being uh, it's it's been a great privilege here talking with great people like you, Jerry. So let me let me bring this back to home, right? So so right now it's it's a crazy time. I mean, it's a time of transition. It's not all roses. It's not all easy out there. So for somebody that's been struggling, that's been through this crazy pandemic that, you know, hey, it's been it's been tough times. You know, what what kind of advice would you give to them right now in a, in a broad scope? Two quick things. One, I was president and global head of technology for Reuters and I was spending about six days a week traveling and I realized that my tank was empty. I was unhappy and I wasn't meeting my own personal needs. My kids were small, five, seven, nine years old. And so I tapped out. I just stopped. I resigned, I went home, I sat. Um, and I spent time with my kids for a couple of years, actually. I was fortunate enough to be able to do that. So my first thing is, I, I'm no good if I'm if I'm not taking care of myself. And that means whatever that is for me. I think the second thing is tapping into something meaningful, right? Just something meaningful. I, I have been able to, I've been fortunate enough to find things that are meaningful to me. Um, I was a boy scout. I think we're supposed to leave every place better than we found it. Um, and I feel that way about my life, you know, leave it better than I found it. I've got to be solid in order to do that. And then I do that. Um, and then, you know, the other thing is just have fun, man. It's been so stressful, like all the ups and downs, it's been really stressful. And I, uh, my wife is fantastic. She has agreed to go on this crazy ride with me before we got married. We were talking and we came up with a deal. And I said, I'm, I am an entrepreneur. I was born this way. I started my first company in fourth grade fixing bicycles. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm an entrepreneur. And so we're either going to be wealthy or poor. We're going to be busy or slow. I have no idea what's ahead. We're going to live all over the world. And she said, that's great. Uh, I just want to be able to raise the kids in some type of stable environment. So we worked out that deal. Um, and so because we had that deal, I've been able to really have fun and enjoy it. And, uh, you know, I love the adventure. Well, uh, Jerry, this is this has just been an amazing conversation. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. Let me let me ask you this: Where can listeners find you online? Where where can we find you? The best place is LinkedIn. Um, so look for me on LinkedIn. I'm probably going to pick up Twitter a little bit soon. I just want to I want to be a part of whatever changes there. I used to be there, you know, years and years ago. Um, but, uh, but LinkedIn is probably the very best place with the cryptonomic site. There's just kind of a placeholder as we get ready to launch. And, uh, but I post pretty much three or four times a week on LinkedIn. Well, it doesn't matter because you all heard it here first. Cryptonomic is coming soon. And uh, boy, I I can't be more excited to check it out myself. Uh, Jerry, thank you so much for being here. For anybody that's listening, uh, thank you for for listening. Uh, Always a pleasure. 
Uh, and uh, if, you, if you're listening, uh, please be sure to like, share, subscribe, all that social media good stuff. Uh, we'd love to spread the word from, uh, you know, Triple G and everybody here at Success at Scale. Until we talk next, uh, thank you so much and go get them out there. Peace. Peace.